Thank you, Adina, and good morning, everyone. Really delighted to be here with some very close friends. And I uh, really would like to thank all of you for everything that you do to help make us a better and more worthy Jewish people. And Noah, I'm delighted to be here with you as well. I've been to the kitchen and uh, I look forward to a return. You're just doing extraordinary work. So the, the great internal challenge facing the Jewish people today is our increasing inability to balance the two essential components of a healthy Jewish identity, which are our particularist commitments and our universal longings. Built into the very foundations of the Jewish people are these two opposing commitments, tribalism and cosmopolitanism, these two opposing sensibilities. And the founding moment is when God tells Abraham, lech lecha, leave, go forth, leave your, the land of your birth, leave the ho your homeland, leave your parents' home and go to the land that I will show you. And there's something almost cruel about that forcible extraction from the world that Abraham knew and grew up in for the sake of separating him from the nations and creating a distinct identity. But when God explains to Abraham some verses later, what the motivation for extracting him from his surroundings was, we see the introduction of a universal goal, which is kol all the all the families of, of the earth, all the nations of the earth, will be blessed through this extraction, through this separatism. The duality between these two poles of tribal loyalty, separatism, and a universal goal for the creation of this people is built into the very structure of Torah. The Torah, of course, begins with creation, the creation of humanity. It turns into the story, the epic, of a nation, a particular people, and it culminates by a return to its initial universalism with the prophet's vision of humanity gathered in prayer in Jerusalem, the oneness of humanity. In that sense, Judaism can be called a particularist strategy for a universal goal. And given that universal goal that's built into the very foundation of the Jewish people, it's not surprising that throughout our history, we've been tempted by universal movements. Periodically through our history, large numbers of Jews have wondered, is this the moment? Is this the moment that Judaism, in effect, was preparing us for? Is this the moment when humanity is about to break out into an experience of oneness? And the first time we really experience this tension between the particular and the universal is Hanukkah. The Maccabees revolt against the universal culture of the Hellenists, which promises precisely that, a universal oneness. And then throughout our history, the emergence of Christianity, 19th century European Enlightenment, Marxism, and in our time, globalism. At the same time that we're experiencing the latest outbreak within the Jewish people of this impatience with particularism, with tribalism, this longing to, to, to seize a universal moment, which in, its, which in its way is actually so Jewish. 
we're also experiencing a strong backlash against universalism, against tikkun olam, or what its opponents would call tikkun olamism. And I know that backlash very well because I grew up in it. I grew up in a neighborhood some of you may know, Borough Park in Brooklyn, in the 1960s and 70s. It was, at the time, the largest concentration of Holocaust surviving families in the US, maybe, maybe anywhere. And Borough Park was really, in, in some sense, the capital of the Jewish wound. That sensibility, that part of the Jewish people which said, we don't want to be part of the world that created that. You're ready now to accept us into your world. Now it's too late. And I always felt growing up that if Borough Park could have built a moat around the neighborhood to separate it physically from the rest of the world, from the non-Jewish world, and from the rest of the Jewish people, which from the sensibility of Borough Park was making unconscionable um, compromises, cultural compromises with the non-Jewish world, then Borough Park would have constructed a moat. Living in Israel now for the last 35 years, the rising isolationism feels very familiar to me. Because what we're experiencing in Israel today is precisely that backlash against the failed gods of the 19th and 20th centuries. Certainly we see that among the Soviet immigrants coming to Israel. And we hear it in a different way from the Jews who come from Arab countries, the Mizrahim, who tell many of the Ashkenazim, well, you don't understand the Middle East, although I think Israelis of all ethnic uh, backgrounds understand the Middle East today very well. The growing threats to the Jewish people reinforce this backlash against universalism. The convergence of left and right, far left and far right, threatening some of the most basic achievements of the Jewish people, is reinforcing this sense of the psychological moat. And what we're experiencing today is a challenge, a growing challenge from both left and right to the post-Holocaust success of the Jewish people in reclaiming power. The legitimacy of power, of Jewish power, is under increasing scrutiny. In Israel, we re reclaimed hard power and you in the American Jewish community reclaimed soft power. The soft power of coalition building, of philanthropy, of financial success, of lobbying, affirming our political interests in the American public space. And it's precisely these two post-Holocaust achievements that are now being threatened by both left and right. In the last months, I've been increasingly haunted by the sense that we are seeing the decline of the golden era of the Jewish people in the post-Holocaust period. And you know that you don't always realize that you're in a golden era until it begins to wane. And that's what it is beginning to feel like for me. The natural response among many Jews is to barricade themselves into a survivalist ethos. And to regard universalist longings as a dangerous distraction, a Jewish fool's errand. I recently spoke at two rabbinical schools in New York. I will not name them, although from the details that will follow, some of you I think will be able to figure out where I was. The first was orthodox, the second was liberal. They are separated by a relatively short subway ride, and yet they inhabit conceptually 
different worlds. When I spoke in the Orthodox seminary, and I brought in the question of the Jewish people's relationship with the non-Jewish world, the immediate pushback among the rabbinical students was to quote the biblical verse from Bil'am, Am levadad yishkon, a nation that shall dwell alone and not be reckoned, a people that shall dwell alone and not be reckoned among the nations. And that, for <clears throat> most of the people in the audience, was the beginning and the end point of a discussion about the Jewish relationship with the rest of the world. There really is not much to discuss beyond that verse. A short while afterwards, I spoke at the liberal seminary, and I asked them for their reaction. I told them the story about what I encountered, and I said, well, how do you all feel about Am Levadad Yishkon? And many of the rabbinical students in the room didn't know what I was talking about, simply were not familiar with the verse, and certainly were not familiar with the seminal role that that verse has played for millennia in the Jewish psyche. So the question is, how do we get the balance right? How do we try to pull back from the brink? Because at this moment, we are dividing into, into separate camps of increasing universalists and increasing particularists who don't share the most minimal common language, who don't even understand the verses that the other side quotes. And I'll speak for a few moments as an Israeli. The balance between our tribalist commitments and our universalist vision is enshrined in our Declaration of Independence. And according to the framers of the Declaration, the State of Israel contains two inseparable, non-negotiable identities. The first is that Israel is the state of the whole Jewish people, including Jews who are not citizens of Israel. And the second is that Israel is the state of all of its citizens, including those who are not Jews. And I'm going to emphasize the second definition for a moment because that is the definition that is now under direct threat within Israeli society, uh, first and foremost by the Prime Minister, who just the other day explicitly said that Israel is not the state of all of its citizens, which to my reading of the Declaration is a profound negation of half of our being. Those two identities entwined represent the liberal nationalism, the spirit of liberal nationalism with which Israel was founded, and maintaining that spirit of liberal nationalism is essential to helping us navigate a globalizing world. For me, the notion of liberal nationalism sounds natural, though increasingly in our polarized world, uh, it sounds like an oxymoron. Uh, I grew up uh, not only in Borough Park, but in, on the political right. Uh, I was a member of the Beitar Youth Movement when I was a teenager. And Beitar, of course, was the youth movement of Jabotinsky and Menachem Begin. And the Beitar that I grew up in was a repository of the spirit of Jabotinsky which was an old-fashioned 19th century liberal nationalist spirit. And we took that for granted as the basis of our Zionism. And while I no longer personally situate myself in that camp, I feel personally betrayed when the leader of that camp, the Prime Minister of Israel, effectively says that liberal nationalism is an oxymoron and liberalism is the negation of the essence of Zionism. Now, in theory at least, if you look at how the Jewish people is structured today, we are in principle ideally positioned to navigate a globalizing world. The diaspora 
is by its very definition a global people. Let's use the Hebrew term, Am Olam. Am Olam is a beautiful and, and, and ambiguous term. On the one hand, it refers to the Jewish people as the people of eternity, Am Olam. Olam can mean eternity. A people that is indestructible. But a second meaning of Am Olam would be more literal, the people of the world. The people that is not only spread throughout the world, but is actively engaged with the world, Am Olam. And to ensure that in this globalizing moment, the Am Olam doesn't disappear, we have a strong national center in the state of Israel. But for Israel to play a positive role in reinforcing the ability of the Am Olam to navigate this globalizing moment requires that Israel maintain a commitment to liberal nationalism. It requires an Israel that remains attractive to diaspora Jews. The Jewish state law, which was passed about half a year ago, has been called by its opponents as racist and by its defenders as affirming the essential identity of the state of Israel. And I would argue that both its detractors and its defenders are missing a crucial point. To my mind, that law is not racist. It doesn't undermine the individual status of Israel's non-Jewish citizens. And as its defenders note, that base, the, there is a basic law that was passed in the early 90s affirming the democratic right of every citizen of Israel. But what its defenders don't admit to is that this law is about defining the identity of the state. And when you define the identity of the state as only either the Jewish state or only as the state of all of its citizens, you are, you are committing a profound blow to our ability to hold these two identities together. The Zionism that I'm looking for is one that not only tolerates the diaspora, and we have moved into that phase where, where Israel today, official Israel, certainly tolerates the existence of diaspora. You don't really hear the old Zionist ideology of negation of the diaspora anymore, except in certain circles on the right. But in mainstream Israeli society today, that's not the discourse. But respect for the diaspora, respect for the essential need for a healthy Jewish people to be composed of both a center and a diaspora, that language is largely missing from Israeli discourse. The exile of the Jewish people did not end in 1948. I would argue that it ended in 1989. 1989 was the moment when the Iron Curtain fell, when the Ethiopian Jews began coming as well. And for me, the definition of exile is very simple. It is the enforced condition of separation from the land of Israel. Once that separation is voluntary, it's no longer exile but diaspora. And so as of 1989, with the fall of the Iron Curtain, the Jewish people entered the phase of diaspora. I was in the American Jewish community when the Pittsburgh massacre happened, and I spent the following weeks traveling through the Jewish communities. And what struck me was how American American Jews are. The memorial services that I attended in different cities, where local officials spoke or local ministers spoke, the language that one heard from the non-Jewish speakers was not solidarity with the Jewish community. It wasn't sympathy. It was empathy. It was, this is an attack, an attack on a synagogue is an attack on America. And I think you all felt that in the aftermath of Pittsburgh. So that Pittsburgh, the way that Israelis 
understood Pittsburgh was, you see, Pittsburgh proves that America is no different. But the aftermath of Pittsburgh proved precisely the opposite. It proved how deeply at home American Jews are in this society. And I see that as a Jewish victory that Israel should celebrate as well. And for me, a contemporary definition of Zionism is the ideology of Jewish peoplehood. There are all kinds of movements, ideas, attempts to undermine basic Jewish solidarity. And Zionism makes an argument about Jewish identity, which is that our ground is peoplehood and all other identities are the adjectives to the noun Jew. In order to help restore the balance between the particular and the universal, which again I see as the greatest threat facing us today, Israel needs to do two moves. It needs to reinforce its intimate relationship with the diaspora, and it needs to strengthen that part of its identity that is not Jewish. It needs to strengthen that part of its public space that is neutral, in which non-Jews and Jews can come together without sacrificing the basic elements of the Jewishness of the state. But American Jews have a role here as well. Each community needs to engage in a deeper self-reflection and to really examine what its role is in encouraging the threat to our ability to hold our particular and universal identities. In particular, what I need from American Jews as an Israeli is a more mature relationship with Israel. For my generation of American Jews, Israel could do no wrong. We didn't want to know what the problems were. Increasingly now, I feel for young American Jews, Israel can do no right. And that is simply the other side of that immature relationship. It is a refusal to deal with the complexities of Israel, good as well as bad. And it is this insistence on dealing with Israel as symbol rather than reality. An example is a growing tendency among liberal American Jews to seek Israeli allies on the far left of the political spectrum in Israel. If you pay attention to what's happening today in the, elect in the election campaign, the, comp the contest is no longer between right versus left, it's right versus center. And the American Jewish community, especially the liberal part of the American Jewish community, has not yet figured out how to engage with the center which I believe is the place from which hope will come for religious pluralism, for an eventual end to occupation. It is the center which represents large numbers of Israelis, while the left and the far left have become increasingly marginalized and irrelevant. So we need a relationship, a partnership, between liberal American Jewry and the Israeli center. My final thought comes from this moment on the Jewish calendar. And I've said this for years and written about this, and I, I, I ask forgiveness for those of you who have heard this from me many times. Nevertheless, given our proximity to Purim and Pesach, my strong sense of this moment in Jewish history is that the Jewish past is speaking to us in two commanding voices. Two commanding voices to remember two distinct experiences. One is remember that you were strangers in the land of Egypt, and the message is clearly, don't be brutal. The other is remember what Amalek did to you when you were leaving Egypt. Remember that you live in a world in which genocide is possible, 
And the message there is don't be naive. And so the first voice is the voice of what we can call the Pesach Jew, the Jew who is pulled to that part of our identity that leads to tikkun olam. And the second is the voice of Purim, the voice of survival, and that leads to survival, survivalism as the center point of Jewish identity. The challenge for our generation is to hold these two sensibilities. However much they clash, and they do in all of our political, cultural divisions. But it's to hold the sensibility of Lech Lecha, of the need for Jewish tribalism with, and you shall be a blessing to the nations. It's to hold the commanding voice of Purim and of Pesach because any other option, if we continue in this direction of pulling into opposite directions, we will end up as a caricature. Each camp will end up as a caricature of itself. And we will, God forbid, miss a moment that really could lead to an unprecedented flowering of Jewish life, both in Israel and in the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yossi. These days, I think a lot about Yitro. You remember Yitro, right? Father-in-law of Moshe, of Moses, shows up after we've left Egypt and crossed the sea when we, the Israelites, are in the middle of the wilderness, in the middle of nowhere. Oh, and I should mention Yitro, not an Israelite. Yitro shows up because he hears a story that compels him to drop everything in his life and to come and find us. What does he hear? From a quick read, you'd think it's obvious. We just left Egypt, after all. Some good stories there. But as usual, the rabbis complicate the matter, and they decide in their wisdom that it could have been any wild variety of things that he heard. Regardless of what he heard, we know this story was life-changing, no matter that he'd missed our whole exodus of leaving Egypt, Yitro sacrifices honor and power, and he runs out into the middle of desert to catch up and to help. And this is no excursion. He goes without any plans to return. Based on what I see here in San Francisco, there's two reasons why I think the story of Yitro rises to the surface now. Two reasons why Yitro is important for our discussion about Jewish identity. The first is obvious. Yitro is not born an Israelite, and of course, there's no such thing as being Jewish yet. And while the rabbis talk about him as a model of an early convert, there's a lot of free license in that interpretation. See, ethnically, Yitro is not one of us on any level, but in terms of his ability to show up and sacrifice and help, he becomes indispensable. And it makes me think that it's possible that by counting our people primarily through Jewish ethnicity or lack thereof, we are simply counting the wrong people. See, the first reason I think we're in the time of Yitro, non-Israelite father-in-law of Moses, is because we too have people who want to marry our people. They compromise many of the families represented in this room. I think the intermarriage rate in Marin, where I used to live for my generation, is like 80%. They're just like the people in Torah. I think about the academic philo philosopher, stoic grandfather of the bat mitzvah that I met last year. Not Jewish. His daughter had converted, so his granddaughter was being raised Jewish. And as you would expect, he'd been present around his daughter's family as it grew. He wasn't Jewish, but after the bat mitzvah, we didn't give him a choice. We lifted him in the chair during the hara. And when it was all over, he came over to me at the end of the party, and this man was crying. Because he always wanted to be part of the Jewish story, but no one had ever thought to invite him. 
and he didn't know he was allowed to count. He's like, Yitro, I thought. I told him, just keep showing up. And he cried some more. Or I could tell you about the hundreds of people I meet, the curious brides, of course, but also the 15-year-olds who show up wanting to learn how to read Torah, their secular hipster parents confused at how they ended up in a religious setting, the young husbands who come to class after class after class, open eyes, the roommates, the volunteers from Glide who then showed up for Shabbat and somehow never left, the woman who was dating someone Jewish, but they broke up and he moved away and could she stay? all ages and walks of life who hear something, who experience something, and they want to be a part of what we do. They want to do Jewish with integrity. They want to help. And while we sure do a lot of conversions every year, not everyone is ready to convert at this moment. Just as people who are genuinely following in love are typically not ready to get married on the first date or even the second, not yet. Many of these people are not ready to convert, but when they're accepted as they are, or when they're counted, you can see it. They found where they belong, with us. This is why, after years in the rabbinate, 20 years, decided that the question of Jewish identity, the first threshold crossing question, needs to be much less, are you Jewish, and much more, what Jewish thing are you willing to do? What are you willing to learn? What will you sacrifice? What do you have to offer? As we like to say at the kitchen, you could be Moshe Rabbeinu, you could be Moses himself, but if you're not willing to do anything Jewish, participate, teach, there's not much I can do with you. But if you are not at all Jewish, if you are Yitro and you're willing to drop everything, come to the Jewish wedding, be married in the Jewish wedding, prepare for that wedding, learn, be part of Shabbat, hear stories, let yourself be moved by them, give advice, practice mitzvot, be a recipient of our tradition, then what business do I have in keeping you away? Rather, it seems we have a lot to do together. It seems my job is to give you some tools so that you can ascend to another level. See, my impression of the Jewish world is that we have been obsessed with Jewish, with ethnic identity and boundaries. But once a person is inside, there are precious few demands. Too often being in the Jewish club is like a joke, a wink. As if knowing nothing and doing nothing is acceptable, normal, status quo. At the kitchen, I wanted to create a community around great and serious demands. We are not always successful, but this is our aim. And so at the beginning, we put pedigree questions aside. Not forever. I just didn't want the person's lineage to be the ultimate starting point. I wanted to start with a more complete assessment of the person in front of me, one that included intent and a willingness to see things through. Not to mention post 23 and me, even just looking around SF in 2019, it turns out measuring ethnicity is no longer so clean and definitive. In fact, it's downright messy. Pluralism, the idea we would each have one ethnic religious camp, a home base that we would then use to share perspectives with others, is positively quaint. It's like an old fairy tale here. I got people who come to me with three and four ethnic religious designations, and that's even before we consider pilgrimage mom took in the 1960s that changed the family's view on religion, or the fact that dad, now that he's married to the third wife, is sharing his new wife's affinity to Buddhism. Building a Jewish identity on ethnicity is just far too inaccurate. If we measured participation at the kitchen on the purity of ethnicity alone, we would look like a dismal failure rather than reflecting the thousands of people we serve. It's like measuring different base levels on the stereo while ignoring things like treble or volume or the number of speakers or even the fact that we can change what kind of music is playing. Not to mention all along we have known Ethnicity is only a container. It can only designate what might be possible to hold inside. And for me, Jewish containers are only precious insofar as they create the possibility of holding living Torah, which I define broadly, and we could argue about what living Torah means, I hope we will for many years. But my point here is to focus first on Jewish identity without an equal or greater emphasis on literacy, experience, connection, or demand. To me, it is like accepting an empty container. While it surely can be displayed or counted, it is at best a consolation prize. 
It is like a kosher ketubah without a real marriage to go with it. It is like bronzing the cover of a book without knowing what, if anything, is written inside. There's a second reason I think we're living in the time of Yitro. And that's because according to the rabbis, Yitro is drawn to us because of a story that he hears. A story that makes him willing to sacrifice and give up whatever he has accrued in his life. Let me say it plain. Yitro does not come careening into the wilderness because of great marketing. Or because someone collected his data and he got a targeted invite. Or because the Israelites had appealing swag. Or even because all his friends were there. He showed up because and only because there was a story in which he felt compelled to take part. Kitchen's not really in any proverbial category or denominational tent. So I get a lot of calls from people with Jewish ideas. I even get calls from foundations. One time I got such a call, and of course this is a foundation far, far away, not a foundation that would ever be represented in this room. And the program officer said to me, our mandate designed by the founders is that we give to further Jewish life. The problem is that we're in our third and fourth generation of our founding family and our current board members, while technically Jewish, are not interested in Jewish life. Could you help us design something to engage them? A video? A cool thing? I love design. We use tons of design, but I told her anything that my team could design would be easily, quickly exceeded by things her board members could find in the secular world in one click. There's no Jewish merchandise that can help in your situation, I told her. The only thing we can do is stop trying to sell Judaism. Instead of treating your board members like VIP customers, introduce them to teachers who will whisper to them in a way that they can hear that understanding Torah, trying to respond to questions in Torah, the life it demands, and the experiences available, this is one of the greatest privileges of one's life, one that must be constantly earned and re-earned. She never called me back, but I choose to believe that's because my advice was so spot on. She didn't need any more of my help. See, what I love about Yitro is that according to some traditions, he had access to wealth and power. That is part of what makes his trip into the middle of nowhere permanently so remarkable. He had what to lose. Not to mention the rabbi's offer Yitro was spiritually worldly. He'd been around the mystical block, if you know what I mean. Reminds me of many people I meet here in SF. Knew his way around Burning Man, if you know what I mean. It's also what makes this choice interesting, because Citro also did not need a spiritual fix. He had access to all the spirituality in the world. What brought him was something else. It was the story. He wanted to be part of the story. And I'm thinking maybe we need a story like the story that compelled Citro. So what story was it? But the rabbis are not in agreement. And today we have many stories from Torah that inspire our people. But I'm thinking we also have a tremendous story, a superlative story, a story so that is borrowed by the world many times over. Yossi mentioned it because it is so profound. And we say it weekly in Kiddush and on Shabbat and daily in our prayers. In Micha we discuss it at length on Passover. It is ingrained in our hearts. We were slaves in Mitzrayim in the narrow place. And God brought us out with a mighty hand and an out outstretched arm with signs and wonders. It is a holy story, and I only have two major issues with it. First, this story syncs up so fully with the last hundred or so years, so elegantly, as in we ourselves have witnessed the slavery of Shoah and the miracle of the birth of the state of Israel. It syncs up so completely, we can come to no other reasonable conclusion other than we and our parents and our grandparents are indeed living this very story. And when we look back on the past decades and see where we are now, Israel established and thriving, we can come to no other conclusion than the story is in its final chapters, ending pretty much over, over, right? Yeah, because we're free, thank
thank God Shoah ended. Not only did we survive and we have the land of milk and honey, not to mention USA, land of silicon and money. We, the Jewish community, are in a glorious startup nation, last chapter. But even if you're willing to swallow the strange and bitter pill that Israel rises from Shoah, something I myself do not abide by, even putting that aside, the problem with framing that we are riding off into the sunset and in the last chapter of our story is that no Yitro, frankly no one with a pulse or very few people are going to drop everything to work to be part of a story that is over. Simply put, there's no room for a new generation when the solutions have supposedly already been found. I mentioned I get a lot of calls from struggling agencies and synagogues. Invariably, they all ask me the same question. It's some version of, how do we get the young people? Since my teenage daughters would double over laughing at the designation of me as leader of the young people, I'll explain to the uninitiated that in Jewish land, young people translates to people younger than baby boomers. Back to the call. After we clarify that young people encapsulates two to three generations, possibly four, I tell them to give over at least 51% of their board to the demographic they seek to become and let that board run the organization. My point being that as long as a group does not make up an institution's visionaries and stakeholders, they will always be a variant of customer. It is only when we are willing to give up power and the trajectory of a given institution or foundation or federation that we may bring in another generation. Everything else is just trussed up versions of the proverbial kids table. Believe me, they see it from a million miles away. There has to be another way of telling the story so that the future goals are not already predetermined, so that participation amounts more than consuming easy things and parroting slogans, so that would-be leaders know they are up against real and difficult decisions with the accompanying consequences. Remember, Yitro doesn't just show up, he helps. He gives Moses a sense of purpose during a difficult time. He helps Moses get out of his own way, makes him delegate some of the legal decisions. Without Yitro, we might still be waiting in line in the desert. In fact, Yitro changes the trajectory of our Israelite community because not only is he allowed to participate, he's allowed to get in there and shape what's happening. My other issue with our incredible story of leaving Egypt and becoming free is that even though we say of Adim Hayinu, we were slaves in the past tense, many of us still deep down very much identify as just recently slaves. We were slaves like five minutes ago. Since there's nothing in the verses that now identifies us as royalty or artists or government officials or parents or rabbis or lawyers or doctors or real estate titans or activists, even though there's a part right after those famous lines that gets cut out of the Haggadah, which talks about our giving back to the stranger and the orphan, even though Tara uses this story and the idea of our being strangers to remind us to reach out to the stranger repeatedly and in many contexts, when we tell the story we were slaves and God brought us out with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, when we tell the story, it seems we can't help but hang on to the idea that we are newly freed slaves. As in, we might be slaves again at a moment's notice. As in, watch your back. As in, be suspicious of Yitro. As in, be suspicious of all newcomers, especially if their allegiance is not proven in advance. As in, be suspicious even of each other. One never knows. And combine that powerful, pervasive, I was just a slave narrative with the facts of Shoah, throw in some very real incidents of global anti-Semitism, not to mention Israel's unrelenting enemies, tunnels and rockets, extremists bent on Jewish destruction. Combine that deep groove, that powerful, pervasive, I was a slave just yesterday, I might be one tomorrow, line of belief. Combine that narrative with just enough ongoing evidence from the harsh world, and we can see why the Jewish identity of many is against much evidence to the contrary, that of a small and maligned group haunted and hunted as if we admit we are free, but just until the next anti-Semite is strong enough to come and get us. 
And so we have a strange kind of self-identification, a funhouse mirror way we see ourselves, like lottery winners who still clip coupons preparing for the inevitable recession. The way we see ourselves, in most cases, incongruous with who we are. Because the reality is, we have a lot of power, and we have tremendous resources, whether in Israel or the US. And so when we insist we're just one incident away from being vulnerable and weak, and I believe we do this quite genuinely, leaning on our place in the old story, we were slaves just, just yesterday. When we do this, this is a most dangerous and self-defeating disconnect because at a time when we need to learn how to be agile, how to tell a story to ourselves about ourselves that is true to this moment, that resonates with the complexity of now, a story that brings the Yitros, born Jewish and not born Jewish, clamoring, running from near and far to help, Yitros we often cannot even see as allies due to our selective blindness and fear, at a time when we need a story that protects us, not just from imagined historic foes and phantoms, but also from the very real challenges we face in this moment at a time when we need a story that will carry us through to another era that we cannot understand, that perhaps only our grandchildren will understand, we are still largely institutionally and communally anachronistic. Given what we have been through and are going through, this is understandable, but it is still tragic. We're using a story that simply no longer fits. It's threadbare. It doesn't cover us. It actually exposes us. For we are not just newly freed slaves. And as strangely comfortable as our part in that story might feel, we need a place in the story that goes beyond scaring the Jewish community into temporary allegiance. As much familiarity as anti-Semitism might offer, as known as that script surely is, look around this room, look at this room. We are not newly freed slaves. We were slaves, true, and God redeemed us, Baruch Hashem. And now we must remember that there are still slaves, very, very close to here, just down Ellis Street. Take a walk. You don't have to go far. And in other parts of America, there are systemically neglected people too. And I'm ashamed to say people who are systemically oppressed in this country at this prosperous time. And there are people who are far from free in Israel as well, people who are suffering and are systemically oppressed by many hands, some of them ours. So we must ask ourselves and quickly, is it possible that we were made free but we forgot what freedom was for? Is it possible that we built a lot of beautiful organizations and institutions but forgot why they exist? Is it possible that self-perpetuation slowly but surely has become its own kind of mission, superseding any other? I'm not saying any of this change or making new solutions will be easy. I'm just saying we cannot afford to lean on this narrative a minute longer. It is past time for us to imagine ourselves anew in the story. It is a matter of our ability to evolve and thrive now and in the future. So may I last suggest a new telling of our old story. Not we were slaves. Not we were slaves. But there are slaves in narrow places. And they cry out from harsh treatment and from their suffering. And God will bring them out with a mighty hand and an outstretched arms with signs and wonders. And that leaves us with one last question. For if we are not the slaves, who are we? We are not God. That much is certain. And we may live in a whole variety of protected palaces, but I pray we are not the pharaohs, nor the taskmasters, nor the bystanders. Indeed, that's why our Torah repeats itself so much on this very topic, because Torah knows it is so easy to protect oneself and forget the strangers and the powerless. So maybe I would just end with a prayer that we don't forget our Torah, and we don't forget our ingenuity and courage. 
so that in this version of the story, in this moment of potential redemption, in this moment when there is great unrest in our world, since we know we are not the slaves and we know we are not God, I pray we work to be the mighty hands and the outstretched arms, the very agents that once helped bring freedom into the world. Maybe if we work together and we work hard, our generations will be recorded as instigators of justice and agents of righteousness and of heaven. I hope one day we'll all live to see it so that one day I can say to my daughters, see that courage? See that thing we all thought was truly impossible but with sacrifice, with our work, it really happened? That's what Torah means when it says signs and wonders. So what do we do now? <laughs> I, um, maybe I'll just say a few words in response. Uh, I, um, I think that that was one of the strongest and most profound articulations of a form of Judaism that would be almost unintelligible to most Israelis. And that's and, and, I'm, and I'm saying that really as, a, as to emphasize the growing inability of Israelis and American Jews to share the same language. And I would agree very strongly with, with your affirmation of two things. First of all, that we are a story. In fact, my, my definition of who the Jewish people are is that we are a story that we tell ourselves about who we think we are. And that's why the Seder is the last ritual to go for even the most alienated Jews. It's, it's the time we, we, we struggle with our, our origins, our the meaning of our story. And, and I agree with you as well that we need a more positive story that we can't keep hanging on to the persecution story. But here's where, where an Israeli sensibility would, would revolt. <clears throat> and that is that to use our 4,000 years of history only to bring us to Tikkun Olam and to simply erase the threats that we are facing. I mean, my reality, and, and again, this is the view from Jerusalem as opposed to the view from San Francisco. Uh, my reality is that I live with constant threat and I live with impending war from any border at, at any time. And the question is, does that mean that San Francisco and Jerusalem are, because of our radically different geographical circumstances, are incapable anymore of speaking a shared Jewish language? And that's a question that I'm posing to you. <clears throat> I don't think that we're so far apart. Mm -hmm. I actually took great pains to recognize the threat and do. And I think I wouldn't make a character of either side. I think um, the Jews that I represent are deeply connected, especially post-Pittsburgh to oh, physical threat, to anti-Semitism. Um, they may be not as close to the threat in Yerushalayim as you or I would like, but I believe they are. I think the question is not um, Purim or Pesach. I think the question is, given that we are in this place with this much power, what will we do with it? What is our Torah demand that we do with it? Of course, if we are dead, we can't do anything with it, right? At the same time, if we are only a container, if we are only a survivalist nation, what is the point? So I think I'm trying actually to move the conversation away from, um, we will, as you said earlier, we'll only be successful if um, it's not an either or. 
Of course, we must survive. Here, survival actually looks like countering the factors uh, against uh, secularism, consumerism, assimilation, saying there's a there there. There's a strong, there's a strong Torah that you would want to be a part of. Um, and I think also being future focused. I, I think in the same way that you live a reality of a, of a threat, I meet people pretty much every week who, if we didn't meet them and talk with them, would no longer be Jewish. There's, there's no question in my mind that thread would end. Should we take a couple questions? Yeah. Can't really see. <laughs> okay. Um. I appreciate so much what you're saying, and I think, um, I just wonder how we all have so many common values, and we're so divided. And I will say, personally, I would be labeled a liberal Jew who took on being president of Stand With Us in Seattle, which raises people's, what? And I did it for the one reason, bring my friends who would have a Twitter-like reaction to the label of one organization and stay out of it, begging them to have just open minds and ears to the pluralistic place we need to be in the center, and how we can really all further that, further that conversation. You know, I think one thing that we can all do is agree that the center feels different for different people um, and to remove taboos. So ideally we would ask people to, to be able to walk into a space and have a dialogue. But I think one thing that's happening uh, that's interesting in the Jewish community overall is um, organizations that were once considered big tent and inclusive of many are now considered to be rightly or wrongly, the perception is that they're a place on the political spectrum. So perhaps a new Big Ten organization has to be convened, or perhaps there has to be an acknowledgement that you have several large um, narratives that are going on at one time. Yeah, you know, what, what, what I would like to see more of in the Jewish people are liberal Jews like you, Elaine, going into spaces, Jewish spaces that are not considered liberal, like Stand With Us. And on the other hand, young Israel rabbis, for example, going on encounter trips. I think we need to scramble the map. Because my, you know, my, my great fear is that we're dividing, again, that we're dividing into, into two peoples. <clears throat> one, one camp, the survivalist camp, which will be increasingly defined by a certain moral coarseness, whether it's what we see with, let's say, the Trump supporters in the Orthodox community here, or what Netanyahu represents, and what, if he, if he wins the election, what that next government might look like. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, Jews who are, who are uh, immersed in the tikkun olam narrative, for whom protecting the Jewish people is either an afterthought or a negation of, uh, of remember that we were strangers in the land of Egypt, illegitimate. And so I worry about us being divided between a, a camp of, of brutality and a camp of naivete. You explain something about the timing of why you see these changes happening now. So many ways Israel would seem more secure than it's been in decades, and yet the liberal nationalism we're talking about is under its most ferocious attack in our lifetime. And American Jews are <clears throat> more secure in many ways than they've been. Shall I take that? Attack and more established than mm -hmm. perhaps yeah. we've ever been. So I'm curious how you understand the timing of these changes that are going on. Well, Noah, maybe you'll deal with the Amer maybe you'll deal with the American Jewish piece. I'm sorry. What did? To repeat the question, that Israel and American Jewry are more secure than they've ever been. So why, at least in the case of Israel, which I'll address and perhaps you'll address the American Jewish piece of it, is why, why is there a growing assault on liberal democracy in Israel? The, 
the crucial moment to understand Israeli society today is the year 2000. And the year 2000, with the collapse of the Oslo process and the normative Israeli narrative for why that process collapsed, which is that Israel tried on several occasions in the year 2000 to make a deal. It offered a Palestinian state, and the response was four years of the worst terrorism that we've ever had in our history. Whatever one thinks of that narrative, that is normative in Israeli society today, and it transformed Israeli thinking no less than 1947-48 affected the thinking of the generation of Israel's founders. When, is, when the Zionist movement accepted partition in 47, and the response was the invasion of Israel, that created a certain mindset in the generation of founders that lasted a whole generation or more. And so this is something that, that liberal American Jews have, to my mind, never fully internalized. And it explains, first of all, why the political divide in Israel is no longer between right and left, but between right and center. And the center basically agrees with the right on the narrative of the year 2000. And many, many American Jews do not agree with that narrative. And that's one way of explaining the divide between our two communities. And so that, that sense of deepening siege, and yes, in some sense, Israel is stronger than it's ever been, but that's not how Israelis feel. And I'm wondering if that same sense of vulnerability, uh, of course, to a much lesser extent, but nevertheless, a growing sense of vulnerability might begin to shape more and more of the American Jewish discourse. I would talk about generational shift. Generation and a half ago, uh, we have Israelism. That was a top uh, uh, word I just learned from an academic in Seattle. Israel can do no wrong, and it was in place of religion. It was a religion that didn't transmit to the next generation for a whole variety of reasons. And so now you have a second and third generation that um, is coming either neutral or critical based on the media that they read or what they see in the world. And they're not coming with the sense of I'm obligated to this country. And I think the problems stem from there. The two screens here are telling us that our time is up. Zero. <laughs> Zero. So thank you all very much. Thank and you Noah, very much. A pleasure to engage with you now.